Good afternoon. I'm going to share with you my thoughts on the impact of COVID-19 on the economy and fintech. Firstly, COVID-19. I don't really want to focus on the disease itself, but on the economic impacts. As such, let's look about what let's look at what's happened. What's happened is unprecedented. We call it a supply side shock, but there's also been an unprecedented monetary response and an unprecedented fiscal stimulus. At the same time, we've had a breakdown of OPEC. We've had a breakdown of supply chains. We've seen borders close and we've got a demand side shock. So let me remind you about Fisher's quantitative theory of money. MV is equal to PT. Essentially, the money supply times the velocity of circulation as a truism equals the price level times the volume of transactions. Now the money supply we've dramatically increased, but the velocity of money has collapsed. Prices, some are going up because of uh, hoarding. Uh, however, uh, this is a deflationary shock. The transaction volume has also declined. Why? Because we've got effectively a situation where people are literally sitting at home. The reason I'm showing this, Fisher's quantitative theory of money, is that the unprecedented increase in the money supply would traditionally have an impact on prices. When things return to normal, with the amount of money that's been put in the system, this will prove to be inflationary. It's also a demand side shock. This chart shows sales of automobiles in China. Really what's happening is that it's just pure replacement demand and demand for vehicles in the current crisis to service hospitals uh, and uh, do essential maintenance. That is a really dramatic drop. As you can see, the time series is very seasonal anyway, and the last peak uh, in December was lower than previous December peaks. So China was already slowing before this event. Meanwhile, on the supply side, that's also a shock. Here I'm showing ECX emissions. Now effectively, manufacturers, when they make stuff in Europe, have to offset that uh, by uh, doing emission offsets. And this shows the price of those offsets. So clearly, if there's less manufacturing going on, less has to be offset. And so you can see a dramatic decline. So you consider this as a leading indicator. In other words, it's saying that the supply side has also ceased. We know because we can see the shops and the queues, what's going on in terms of toilet paper and other essentials. There is effectively disruptive inventory hoarding. This here shows the price of wheat, and clearly there's going to be a big disruption in the food chain in as much as seasonal workers aren't going to be able to uh, pick the um, harvest as uh, easily as they have in prior years. And obviously demand substitution is taking place between the type of foods that we're buying and storing. Meanwhile, job losses. This isn't just a case of this being a peak in jobs. This is a giant spike. The jobless claims that have just come out have been the biggest in history, as you can see from the chart. Likewise, volatility is the highest in history, higher than at the time of the 2008 credit crisis. Volatility, the proxy for risk in financial markets. Of course, there's been a response to all this by central banks and the yield curve has effectively collapsed. Short yields are down to zero effectively in the United States. But even if we go out 10 years, 30 years, these yields are unprecedented and low. Effectively, what the market is saying through this yield curve is that the recession stroke depression that is going to come as a result of this is being discounted for 
10, 15, right the way up to 30 years. So this is a monumental event. Now, whether or not this price dislocation is short term or not will obviously depend on the rollout of the COVID-19. We have also seen an unprecedented equity market collapse. In fact, the speed and severity of the collapse is actually of a greater magnitude than the uh, crash in 1929. Meanwhile, flight to quality. Essentially, high-grade bonds, the bonds issued by sovereigns or uh, intergovernmental bodies, have literally attracted a massive amount of demand. People are buying them purely for safety. And the reason for that is obvious. If you look at what's happening to earnings, corporate earnings are collapsing. Same time, manufacturing is stalling. We saw that in China, but the purchasing managers index in the US has also fallen off a cliff. In other words, even before the rollout of COVID-19 in the US, uh, they were experiencing much the same slowdown as uh, was saw in China. Now, the oil price shock was something which uh, really came because, firstly, the demand for oil isn't there, oil being a thermometer of the economy. But at the same time, a spat between Russia and Saudi Arabia introduced more supply into the market. So as a result, prices are charging down. You might wonder why they do that at this point in time. Essentially, they want to disrupt and gain market share. Um, and gaining market share when there's a low demand is a more rational policy than trying to gain market share when there's high demand. Effectively, they want to um, take uh, the US shale industry out of the marketplace. Either way, that dislocation is something that markets aren't really configured. So how have traders fared in all this? Well, not very well. Hedge funds, who by definition should be hedged, have found themselves on the wrong end of many of these trades. And in aggregate, here I show the hedge fund research global hedge fund index. In aggregate, they have been really badly hit. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them go to the wall, and I certainly wouldn't be surprised if we see some other collateral damage. In terms of the impact on fintech, well, it's clearly accelerating the demise of paper payments. We're going to see effectively uh, an acceleration of this because at the moment people don't want to use uh, credit, uh, we don't want to use cash because of the unhygienic nature of paper currency. And obviously, a lot of work has been now done remotely. But this probably won't happen overnight because even in the US, 50% uh, of businesses still use paper checks and less than 10% of small and medium enterprise companies are actually automated in respect to their accounts payable. That will obviously accelerate as a result of this, but is not something which will accelerate immediately. In conclusion, there are three different types of bear market, structural bear markets, cyclical bear markets and event driven bear markets. And we're clearly in the latter and they are more unpredictable. We've yet to see the collateral damage, collateral damage in terms of bankruptcy, but also potential nationalization of key resources. Think who's paying for all this? The insurance companies, they don't have the balance sheets for that. They're probably gonna have to be taken into state control. Likewise, the airlines, if you don't fly, essentially you haven't sold the seat. And as a result, they are not strong enough to stand alone and will probably also be nationalized or of course go bankrupt. The other thing I'd add is expect this dislocation to go on longer than the measures put in place. Why? Because things are bankrupt, they can't start up again. If people go back slowly to work, it's not gonna accelerate things quickly. Uh, if people's entire mentality changes from effectively a bull market to a bear market, they don't change overnight on uh, the, the upside. But I want to end on a finally good point, uh, and that is that actually the stimulus package that has been put in place is unprecedented. $2 billion in the US alone, 
sorry, two trillion dollars, even more. Uh, and as a result, I think we can uh, see that uh, what we have is coordinated fiscal policy, uh, and that obviously will alleviate some of the pain.